Hey everyone, welcome back. So there was a lot of requests to do a more robust anomaly detection video, so that'll be the focus of this video. But we'll also introduce a really commonly used tool in time series analysis called the STL, or Seasonal Trend Decomposition. So we'll come back to that in a second, but first let me just introduce the data. So we'll be using some Google Trends data on the search term ice cream. So what you're looking at here is basically just the popularity of the search term ice cream from 2004 until present day, and each data point is a month. So we can obviously tell there's some seasonality, we can see these spikes. We can also see that overall it's kind of going up over time and maybe even becoming more volatile. So our goal today, as we said before, is trying to figure out where the anomalies are. So let's first try to do it visually before we go into the STL and what it is and how do we use it. So to help us out, I'm going to draw bars that separate off each year. So now it's a lot easier to see the seasonal pattern and where that seasonal pattern might be broken. So we see for the first few years, there's nothing special going on. The first anomaly we see visually is here in mid-2011. We see there's a weird double peak, so that might be an anomaly. And we see another even bigger anomaly is late 2016. We see a spike that really shouldn't be there. We see the spikes in the middle of each year because ice cream is popular in the summer in the United States, so that makes sense. But why would there be a big spike here at the end of the year? So that's another one to look out for. And there might even be others, but we're going to have to use a more robust method to figure that out. So here's where we perform the STL. So actually the code for it is very, very simple. So let me just walk through the code first, and then I'll talk about what it actually means. So to perform a seasonal trend decomposition, we use the STL function, which comes from the statsmodels.timeseriesanalysis.seasonal library. We go ahead and put in our data set right here. We go ahead and call STL.fit, and we can get back the seasonal, trend, and residual part. So I went ahead and just plotted it down here, and I think it's easiest to describe if we look at the plot at the same time. So this is what's called the STL, or the seasonal trend decomposition. So here's our original series. And the original series is assumed to be made up of a trend and a seasonal component. So the STL decomposition basically uses a low S smoother, and we won't be going into the theory, but that's the L in STL. It uses a low S smoother to take our original series and break it up into a trend and a seasonal part. So we see that this is the trend, and this makes a lot of sense. If we were to ignore the seasonal part, this is about the shape of this time series. And this is the seasonal part. So this is saying that if we ignore the trend, then this would be the shape of the seasonality. And the STL decomposition assumes that the original series is made up of a trend added to a seasonal component. And the last part of the story is the residual. This is anything that's left over after we take into account the trend and take into account the seasonal component. So we see that there is some noise, and this residual is going to be the big component in helping us detect anomalies. So another graph to look at is what if we plot the original series in blue versus the predicted series. And when I say predicted, I mean trend plus seasonal. So if we plot the trend plus seasonal in orange, we see that it matches up pretty well. And the key insight here is that the areas where it doesn't match up well are going to be what we call anomalies. And we see one here in mid-2011 as we predicted, and we see another big one here at late 2016 as we predicted. But there are others, and we need to decide if those are anomalies or not. So here's how we use the STL, the Seasonal Trend Decomposition, for anomaly detection. So it's going to be very simple. We're going to say anywhere where the residual is very extreme, that's going to be classified as an anomaly. So we see the residual is typically around zero and not very special, but there are places where the residual kind of jumps in a positive or negative direction, and we're going to set some thresholds. So first we get the mean of the residuals and the standard deviation of the residuals. We say the lower limit is going to be the mean minus three standard deviations, and the upper limit is the mean plus three standard deviations. So I chose three because that's typically what's used for outliers in statistics, but you can set this uh, number of standard deviations to anything you want based on your application. So now what I do is I plot the residuals again. So this blue line is the residuals after doing the STL decomposition. And these green bars are the upper and lower limits respectively. So now we basically say any time point who breaches these green bars, either the upper or lower, is classified as an anomaly. And we see that there's three of them one here in mid-2011, one here in late 2016, and one that barely makes it down here at the end of 2015. 
So we go ahead and just plot our original series with the gray year bars and little red diamonds anywhere the anomalies are, and this is the graph we come up with. So this is a really nice visual way to just show where the anomalies are. And we can also show the anomalies in a chart. We see that the three anomalies are in April of 2011, December of 2015, and the biggest one by far is in December of 2016. So now let's just see if there was anything special going on with ice cream in December 2016. So let's do December 2016 ice cream. Let's see if there's anything special. And we see that there was some kind of controversy on ice cream around December 2016. So our whole story does make sense. So that's it guys. This was how do we use the seasonal trend decomposition using low S and we didn't go into the theory of what low S means so let me know if you want to go through that in a future video. How do we use the STL for anomaly detection that's maybe a little bit more robust than we did in the first anomaly detection video. All right so until next time.